We have some gorgeous solar storm eruptions on the sun's limb. We say goodbye to a big flare player that let us down. And more activity on the sun's far side is rotating into Earth view. Those stories and more are in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.com edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week is getting off to a very interesting start. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, filaments are still the name of the game. You can see a ton of them here and there. In just a second, I'll show you some gorgeous filament eruptions that you can see off of the limb. These structures are very massive, and so when they erupt, they are a spectacle. As you can watch, look at this monster up here on the northern part of this, near the poles. This one launches, and then you can see another one down here just a moment later. This is late on the 21st, launches another big monster. And because you can see these things launching so far nor toward the poles, we do know that we're nowhere near solar minimum yet because we're still getting polar launches like this. But we've been watching quite a few different filaments, watching if they're going to erupt. You can see this one here. We've been watching that one. It did destabilize for a little bit, but not anything dramatic enough to get it to launch. But if one of these did launch towards Earth, because they're so massive, they can cause very strong solar storms. So we're keeping our eyes on it. Meanwhile, we also had this coronal hole here. It's kind of hard to see right here in this in, in this wavelength. Uh, you can see it better in stereo here. But this one gave us a little bit of fast solar wind, not much of a, of a show maker in terms of big aurora shows. We had a little bit of something up at uh, high latitudes, but mid-latitude photographers, well, you kind of had to sit this one out. So that was a little bit of a let down. Another one is region 4217 in the cluster of regions right here. They also have been kind of letting us down a little bit. 4217 has been a big flare player, but only popping small impulsive flares. So we just haven't gotten much from it in that way. The real activity is on the sun's far side. You'll see a big jet here in just a moment pop out. Boom. Look at that. Let me back it up a little bit. This is a monster jet. And then we have more big eruptions on the far side from regions that are going to be rotating into Earth view here over the next few days. So as these regions leave, they will get a little bit of a lull and then we'll get new regions entering. And so uh, amateur radio operators and emergency responders expect just a little bit of flux to drop down, expect the noise to die down just a little bit, but then to pick up pretty quickly here as we move into next week. Now, as we switch to our far-sided sun, this is Stereo A, and we've been watching Stereo A imagery again because it does give us a pretty good view from the uh, far side off of the sun's west limb. In fact, you can see here's Earth, here's the sun, and here's Stereo A looking at the sun from the side, from a decent part from the side. So you can see where that coronal hole is here on this side now. In Earth view, it's actually rotated pretty much off of the west limb. And we can see that wonderful cluster of active regions that we gave so much promise to. We thought really it was going to start giving us some big events, but it really hasn't. However, region 4217 and 4220, they've been pretty active. You're seeing a few small mini solar storm launches from it. So her, perhaps as it continues to rotate to the sun's far side, we'll continue to see new regions grow in here and more in instability. So that may be some a cluster that we're going to be looking at as it rotates back into Earth view in about two weeks. But meanwhile, we're going to have to take a look at the full sun to see the whole picture. And now taking a look at our full sun map, we're actually having to use a more complicated version of the map once again because it's kind of hard to get a full picture of the sun's surface. We are using SDOAIA, that's what you can see here in red, that is the front side of the sun, but then we are also using Stereo A EUVI, that's in green, and Solar Orbiter EUI imagery, that's in blue. And to get an idea of how we stitch them together, let's take a look at our orbit circle. So you can see here's Earth, 
here's the sun and here's stereo A, just like we saw in the last segment. And, the, and stereo A is looking at the sun partially from the side, so it's getting a little bit more of the far side of the sun than we can see at Earth, obviously. And then there's solar orbiter here on this side. Now, granted, it's back kind of on the front side of the sun, but it still can peek around the edge. So it's peeking around the east limb of the sun. Stereo A is peeking around the west limb of the sun. And so we have almost full sun coverage except for what we can't see kind of in a sliver right in here. And that's what this little black part is here, is that we just are a little bit blind because we can't quite cover from the west or from the east. So, you know, this sadly, this full sun maps are going to get a little bit harder to, to do, and pretty soon they're going to disappear entirely. So we've got to enjoy them while we have them. But as you can see, when you take a look at the east limb as it rotates off out of view, you can see the west limb here, and then you can see the east limb rotating back into view here on this side. So sorry, it's a little bit of a wraparound kind of ribbon here, but anywhere you see red, that's the front side of the sun. So as we put this in motion, just to get you calibrated, you can see here's that coronal hole we're kind of saying goodbye to that coronal hole on the front side of the sun. We've also got that cluster with region 4217 and 4224 all in this cluster here. So it can, should get you kind of calibrated to where we are. Now, as we switch to the far side of the sun, you can see some new regions rotating into Earth view here on this end. Here's region 4226. But what I want you to pay attention to is we actually had a bunch of regions on the sun's far side in stereo's view. If I back it up a little bit, you can see where those regions are. There we go. So now you can see old region 4207 and 4210. We also had this really big long filament here. This was quite a bit of activity going on as it rotated out of Earth view uh, or out of stereo's view here just a few days ago. So this, re this region here has actually been quite busy. And as we set these regions back in motion, you can see, even though we've got this, this black widening gap opening up here, so we're a little bit more blind than we'd like to be, as we get down to about the 22nd and the 23rd, you can start seeing new regions emerging. Here we go here. You're going to start seeing a few more of them. In fact, these regions start emerging right about the same time we start getting region 4229 and 4030, 4231, I believe, is the number. There we go right there. Notice that is happening at the same time. As I back this up, notice that's happening at the same time you're seeing these new regions. So what it looks like is that we've got what may be a hot set of longitudes right here, sitting right on the east limb and possibly just behind the east limb. And so the, this is what is why we're seeing so many eruptions just behind the east limb and why we're seeing those jets of plasma. Just a lot of new regions rotating and emerging on the Earth-facing disk. So expect that we're going to see a lot of activity here starting in about two or three days as these regions rotate rotate into Earth view, and we could start seeing big solar flares again and big solar storms, because with three or four new regions emerging so quickly, oftentimes that leads to big activity. And now, switching to our moon, we are now coming out of a new moon on our way through the first quarter, and by the second, the moon will be about 74% illuminated. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch some dim objects in the sky, well, I know there really isn't all that much aurora going on right now, but we do have some comets, right, that we're going to be looking at. Reach, uh, comet C2025A6 is a new one that's been found, and that one's about to be visible almost by the naked eye. Not quite yet, but it might be a good one to look for. And sadly, we can't really see Comet 3I Atlas right at the moment, because it's near Mars and too near the Sun, but that one will become visible somewhere later on this year. So definitely keep your eyes on the skies with these comets this year. We've got a lot of them, and uh, they look like they're absolutely stunning with these big long comas that just seem to be getting brighter. And now switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week. At high latitudes, well, we're not expecting all that much at the moment, but we do have a little bit of a of some fast solar wind that's going to be hitting us over the next few days. Starting right around the 27th and 28th, we're going to be looking for that fast solar wind. Uh, so aurora photographers, it, you might actually get a chance for a show. We have up to a about a 35% chance of a minor storm starting by around the 28th, and that will taper off slowly, but by about the 30th, things should be settled down again. So you might get a little bit of a show, but not expecting all that much. Now, as far as mid-latitude aurora is concerned, well, we're still only expecting unsettled conditions, but we do have up to about a 25% chance of active conditions. And so if you're a dedicated uh, storm chaser, well, you might be able to catch those substorms and catch a little bit of brightening, but likely most people in mid-latitudes, you're going to have to sit this one out 
and wait for a bigger storm. And now for our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week. We are sitting well into the one, you know, triple digits with uh, our solar flux sitting around 170 right now. We're expecting that to dip down just slightly because we've got regions 20, uh, 40, excuse me. We've got regions 42, 17, and that cluster in there rotating to the sun's west limb. But we do have those new active regions that are going to be rotating into Earth view here over the next few days. So starting around Monday or Tuesday, we might start seeing a little bit of a tick up. But right now, we're sitting at moderate noise on the bands, uh, expecting 35% chance of M-class flares at the R1 to R2 level radio blackout, and really no chance for R3 level radio blackout uh, over the rest of this week. But like I said, as we move into maybe mid next week, we could start seeing those M flare risk levels rise, and we could start seeing more noise on the dayside radio bands. And now switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week. Everything is in the green this week. We are sitting at the D1 normal range. This is at flight level 360 for you aviators. It's also the S0 quiet range for everyone else. We're likely going to continue this trend easily over the, the rest of this week and possibly into next week. I do have a, a feeling that we're going to start seeing a little bit of a rise in risk for radiation storms, but that may not be until mid next week we'll start seeing a significant rise. I'm showing a little bit of a hint of it early on, but I'm probably being a little bit uh, optimistic in that sense. So uh, you frequent flyers, and this does include air crew and you high risk passengers, you're all in the green this week. But especially as we rotate into about middle of next week, please pay attention to those ICAO advisories because they will let you know if the big solar flares are back. And if so, the risk for radiation storms guaranteed or it's going to increase. So the space weather this week stays mainly on the calm side. We do have some gorgeous eruptions that we've been watching over the sun's limb and on the far side of the sun, but nothing seems to be earth directed. So aurora photographers, well, we have a small pocket of fast solar wind that might be coming. And if you're at high latitudes, you could get maybe a small show, but aurora photographers at mid latitudes, well, only if you're dedicated and you understand how to chase substorms, should you get out there and look. Otherwise, you'll likely be disappointed. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, you might notice that the bands, the noise on the dayside radio bands has gone down just a little bit. It will continue to go down here over the next few days at least before new regions rotate into Earth view from the sun's far side. And then you might see a real big rise kick up pretty quickly. So enjoy the kind of moderate quiet. I know it's a little bit noisy out there, but it shouldn't be too bad because next week things will likely become a bit worse. And now you GPS users, well, you know, things are pretty good right now. We don't have any big solar storms on the sun's uh, or on the sun on the Earth's night side, and we don't have any uh, really big solar flares occurring on the Earth's day side. So overall, GPS reception should be pretty good for you. Of course, stay vigilant during the dawn and dust terminators because that's when things get a little dicey anyway. But overall, things should look nice. I'm Tamitha Sko, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.